Now though, we continue our inspirational true story series with the Herald's New Zealander of the Year 2016, Lisa Rennick, who, while fighting for her own life, decided to fight for the lives of others dying from melanoma. Welcome to the Harvey Norman Lounge, Lisa. Thank you. It is wonderful to have you here. <laughs> Melanoma is something that I think touches a lot of people's lives in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I've had one removed. Oh, they got it early. I was lucky. My mum did. And my uncle died from melanoma. So that's just my family alone. Mm -hmm. um, you were battling it. You were diagnosed the year before last in May? Yep, Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Oh. And so, so what happened? What happened on that day? Uh, uh, I was not feeling well at work. Um, two days later, I said to my husband, take me to the hospital because my abdomen started to swell, mm -hmm. so I looked pregnant. Um, I went, and feeling really embarrassed, you know, a Sunday, sort of went into the hospital saying, I'm really sorry to bother you with this, but... It's such a they, kiwi thing to do too. <laughs> and they said, oh, no, 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 you did the right thing. We'll have to keep you in overnight. And I thought, oh, really, really? Okay, okay. Anyway, within sort of a week, a couple of weeks, they said, we're really sorry. You've only got a couple of weeks to live. Um, there's absolutely nothing we can do. Um, and so you hadn't had any symptoms of melanoma, no mole? Because usually that's the thing we look for, isn't it? Five the years before I had a mole removed from my back, but it was in such, um, it was the early stages. Oh, and, um, sounds uh, The very, very early stages. Mm -hmm. And um, they said it was fantastic. You know, you caught it early, well done, come for mole checks. And other than doing that, I never really thought about it. So when I felt a little bit sick, Last thing in my mind was melanoma. Well, yeah, and to be told that you only had a couple of weeks to live, it must have been devastating, but clearly things didn't pan out that way because you are here with us. So what happened next in regards to finding out what you wanted to do to keep going? You've got to realise that at this stage, I was feeling pretty bad. I was dying. I was dying really quickly. So I was taking a lot of morphine. Um, I was deteriorating quite quickly. Melanoma can be very aggressive. And it... Oh, incredibly aggressive. Mm. I think... I think that's why we don't, or we didn't, hear so much about it, because people die so quickly. Mm. Right. But my, um, it was my family, actually, my husband, who said, no, that's not OK, there must be something that can be done, and pushed until um, he managed to get a referral to a private clinic up here in Auckland. Mm. And uh, I was sent home. He put me in the car. We had the maddest drive where I was basically dying in the car and he was driving got me here, took me to the cancer clinic. I couldn't walk at that stage properly. They took one look at me and thought, I don't think so. Mm. Mm. But again, he pushed for a test, a um, test of the cancer to see if it was uh, carried something called a BRAF mutation. Had he been doing some reading in the meantime? Absolutely. Mm. It was one of the, th the only things they said to us in the hospital when we said, can you offer us advice, was don't Google. And so right. you went home and Googled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, we did. Well, he did. Mm. As I say, I wasn't in any condition to do anything at that point. Uh, we went in 50-50 shot of having the mutation. I had it. So um, I got the right medication, which was a targeted gene therapy, which is all the new medication that you read about. Mm. And um, it meant that a couple of weeks later I was able to stand up again. That's incredible, isn't it? And so lucky that you did the research, I guess, and that your husband, you know, I mean, he, he loves you, so he wanted to do everything in his mm. power to keep you alive. Uh, well, that drug that, that helped you, it's quite expensive, though, isn't it? Mm. Well, don't get the two drugs confused. OK. Because I ended up taking two. Right. The targeted gene therapy drug, the oncologists say it gets you out of a sticky situation. Mm -hmm. It works really quickly to sort of starve the cancer. Um, and enable you to recover, but it stops working. Okay. And so after I'd been on that drug for six months, I then had to move on to the immunotherapy drug, um, pembrolizumab or Keytruda. Right. Mm. Um, Which we've all heard about in the news. Yeah. Yeah. And they're both very expensive drugs, but I couldn't have survived on, with only one. Mm. I needed first one and then the other. So you had some. How did you get the funding for the rest of it, or what happened? Well, I was lucky with the targeted gene therapy drug, and then I managed to get into a compassionate program from the drug company. But when I moved on to the immunotherapy drug, the second drug, we funded it ourselves. OK, because obviously this is, would have cost a lot of money. Not everyone can afford it. Uh, so then you, you found it worked for you, so then you made steps to make sure that other people could receive this. Yeah, I was, I was really angry um, for... Oh, some time. First I was angry because I felt like I'd been written off 
by the hospital system, mm -hmm. which wasn't something I ever expected. And then I was really angry because I was having to spend a lot of money. Um, but I knew that if I was in Australia, I wouldn't. And the third thing that made me really angry was the fact that I was getting treated and it was working. Mm. Here I am in front of you now. Um, but I met people who couldn't afford those drugs, mm. who were dying, who were fighting to survive. Their families were fighting to save them, fundraising. And there was no effective treatment available in the New Zealand system. And that, and that is so frustrating, isn't it? I mean, I can understand your frustration. But, uh, but the good thing is that you went and helped other people by starting a petition. Can you explain what that was for? Yeah, I didn't do it all alone. I, I was at home one day and I just suddenly thought, I'm going to have a petition to Parliament. So one of the first things I did was went to the parliamentary website and looked at how you did that and what hoops had to be jumped through. My husband came home from work and I looked at him and said, I'm going to start a petition and I've made an appointment with Simon Bridges. And he just, oh, OK. <laughs> um, and I reached out on social media. I'd never been a great Facebook person. But again, one of the first things I did when I was able to again was join various Facebook groups. And I realised there were a lot of other people if you imagine people fighting their own little battles, mm. Um, mm. lots of great people, and I thought, well, the petition could be a bit of a focal point. Mm. Um, and all those people got on board and started That's... collecting signatures and organising. And, and it went from there. Now, we've run out of time, unfortunately, which is such a shame, because I really want to talk to you more about this. Um, but such a fascinating story. Lisa, you must be, your family must be very proud of you. Um, I think, well done, well done to you. And it's so lovely to have you sitting on the sofa with us. It really, really is. Yeah, totally. Oh, it really is. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Very, yeah. very inspiring. And thanks for sharing your story.